God bless everyone for coming today. Today I'm going to talk about revival. Amen. And for the Swahili people, Amungwa Akubarichi. Amungwa I don't know how you sp- I don't know how how you got to s- to learn English because <laughs> Swahili is hard, isn't it? It's like two words, and it took me all night last night to learn that. All right, talking about revival. Okay, I'll start with my own uh, uh, interest in in revival and the things that happened as a result of getting interested in in revival. Uh, Judy and I started going to church seriously in 1994 and about 1997 we were at church one morning and the, the pastor was talking about the Welsh revival which happened in about in the early part of the 20th century in 1904. Um, just to give you a bit of background on the Welsh revival it was started by a lot of prayer. All revivals seem to centre around prayer and, and, and longing for more of God. So a young man, I think he was only 16 at the time, an older man said to him, go to all the prayer meetings that you can and don't miss any because you never know when God's going to turn up. Amen. So that young man, his name was Evan Roberts, and he went to all these prayer meetings in the district. There were little chapels, like Methodist Wesleyan chapels um, in the south of Wales, where he lived. And he would go to all these meetings. And uh, yeah, we were in a meeting one night, and, and uh, along with some other young people, and they started to cry out, Bend me, Lord, bend me. And the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them, and and needless to say, revival broke out in Wales. 100,000 people were saved over a period of less than two years. Uh, Radical changes took place in Wales. There were so many people going to church that the hotels and the football matches were no longer attended. So the police, who would normally be breaking up drunken, rowdy brawls at night after drinking, after all the people would start to drink and go into the hotels and that, they, they, they had nothing to do. The churches were so full that the, the policemen would wander off towards the churches to see what was going on because they had nothing to do. All the crime had, had stopped. And... Uh, the drinking had stopped, and South Wales was known as a coal mining district, and the coal miners were in the habit of swearing at the pit ponies, the ponies that would drag the, the coal carts out of the mine. Now, when all these coal miners started to get saved, they stopped swearing, and the instructions that they then gave to the pit ponies couldn't be understood. The pit ponies didn't know what to do because they were used to having swear words given to their, as their part of their instructions to you know move, move and get the coal out of the coal mines. So that was my first uh, introduction to revival. And then a few years later, um, one Sunday morning at church, the pastor started talking about a revival in Pensacola, which <laughs> Judy and I heard it and thought he said Pepsicola. It was such a funny sounding name. <laughs> um, but anyway, Pensacola, it's a town in Florida in the United States. And he started talking about how people were lining up in the morning to go to a service at 7 o'clock at night and that the services would go into the early hours of the morning and then those people would, would start to line up again for the next service. And the, the services went on every day of the week for a long, long time until I think the part, they, they decided they'd have to have one day off a week to, to rest. Um, and that same day that we heard about the, the revival in the actual suburb in Pensacola is called Brownsville was known as the Brownsville Revival in Pensacola. Pensacola's the city, Brownsville's the suburb. 
Judy's brother was going to an assembly of God church that was being held in, a, in the Kenmore Primary School. And he said, oh, would you like to come to the service tonight? So we said, yes. We got to the service and what, did this talk, what does the minister talk about? The revival in Brownsville. <laughs> so twice in one day we heard about the revival in Brownsville. We, a week or two passed, we went to Kurong Bookshop and I said to the man there, do you have any, anything on the Brownsville revival? He said, you're the third person that's asked me about that today. <laughs> so he brought out a CD and a couple of books which... Um, which I have about uh, Brownsville, a feast of fire, and another another one, the children of revival in Brownsville. It's all a book about the young children and how they were affected. They they would actually intercede for the lost young children. You know, children of five and six and eight. Uh, this is actually written by the children's pastor at Brownsville Assembly of God. It talks about how his daughter, who eight years old, was affected and would make noises over, overshadowing the pastor when he was preaching and was embarrassed by it and would say, shh, you know, shh, 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 come on, be quiet, be quiet. But it was after, after a little while he realised that uh, he shouldn't have been trying to quench the moving of the Holy Spirit in his young daughter and realise what God was actually doing through her. So it's... It, Revival wasn't just for the mature, the older people, but was for everyone. It was for the children. And uh, so there we have it. We got, we've, we've now heard about Pensacola through two, two ministers on the same day. We've uh, got some books and some, video, and some CDs and playing the music and getting right into this whole Browns of a Revival thing. A couple of people in our church had videos that came from the Browns revival and uh, we watched them and it was like something that we'd never seen before because it, it kind of made ch church as we knew it seem seemed to p pale <laughs> when you heard these really strong messages there was also another revival that re that uh, preceded the one at Brownsville called Toronto has anyone heard of the Toronto no it was, in a, it was in a church at the airport at Toronto, and it was called the, the Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship. Um, and the Toronto, the Toronto revival was called the Love Revival, and the one at Brownsville was called the Fire and Brimstone Revival. They're two completely different things, but one actually was birthed out of the other one. So... Uh, most of you probably don't know, but Judy and I ran a nursery and we had a glass house which we'd imported from Holland. And uh, I was thinking of having a computer control the, the opening and closing of the glass house roof for ventilation. And a man from Sydney came up whose name was Rex Israel and his, and his wife. He was actually a, a Methodist but uh, of Jewish descent. So if you look at the word Rex in, in uh, Latin, it means king, the king of Israel. So I go out with this king of Israel <laughs> this, this day to see a nursery that had a computer system that controlled the, the heating and the cooling and the ventilation and all that sort of thing. And while we were, while we were out, we were talking and he's, you know, we're still talking about traveling overseas. And I said, I've never wanted to travel to America. It doesn't hold any interest for me at all. Everything I'd seen on TV about America just seemed violent and I didn't, like, I didn't see anything that interested me. I'd rather go to Europe. Anyway, that day came to an end. That man went back to Sydney with his wife. Um, the next morning I got up and at that stage I was a director of Benny Hinn Ministries in Australia. And I checked my email that morning, and here's an email with an invitation to go to where? America. <laughs> At their expense, to go to a board meeting in Orlando, Florida, which was only a short flight away to where Pensacola was. Pensacola was also in Florida. And 
I raced in, told you because that was in the office, I came racing into the house and I said, I've been invited to go to a board meeting in, in Orlando, Florida, and, but it's only for me, <laughs> which Judy was upset, she thought she wanted to go too. And she, was, she spoke to her father a little bit later on that morning. Father said, I will pay for you and the girls to go to America with Barry. So here we are, we're on our way to America and we've decided that we're going to go to Brownsville while, while we're in America. And through, through the position that I held in Benny Hinn Ministries, I was able to get, get to the church through a side door without having to wait in the, in the big long queues to get into the church. Otherwise, we would have had to be there with Natasha and Elizabeth, her eldest sister, who at the time were, how old were you, 10 and 13? I think about, I think about five, and five and eight. Five and eight. Five and eight they were, which would have been a bit of a trial, I think. Anyway, we got there. We went to the service the first night. It was awesome. I give, give us some background. I thought that I wanted to go to a revival, but I thought it was going to be like going to a football match. I thought, you know, you sit in the, in the pews, and you're a spectator. But when you go to a revival, God does something in you that changes your inside. And during that night, they asked for people to come out and give testimonies. So we're at the service. People came out and gave testimonies. Now, one was a minister, and he collapsed out the front under the power of God. And... You know, when the testimonies were over, the service went on. I think the name of the service that night was, uh, that's just the way it is. The evangelist na always named his messages. It was called, that's just the way it is. And it, with that, he would proceed to give a phenomenal message based around that short sentence. So the service came to an end. We got in a taxi, went back to our motel where we were staying. And we, uh, we hadn't had eaten that night. So we went into the restaurant which happened to be next door. We were in there for a short time and in comes the pastor who'd been testifying, who'd collapsed under the power of God and he was being helped into the, into the restaurant by fellow, by his friends or who'd, who'd been there with him because he still couldn't stand up. And this is like about an hour or two later, probably at least two hours later. So, um, we had dinner, we'd witnessed this amazing thing where this pastor comes in and he still can't walk uh, under his own steam. And um, we went to bed that night and realising that we, would, we were going there for four nights. So we'd had our first night, we had three more nights to go and we thought we'd better get to bed early in the afternoon so the children can rest, so we can because the, the, the service would end at 11 o'clock at night. And uh, we thought, they'll get, they'll get tired, we'll get tired. So we lay down in the bed, Judy and I and the kids were there, and after a while, you know, I, I realised Judy hadn't, she was moving around, and I said, can't you get to sleep either? And she said, no, I can't. She said, everything that was going, everything that went through that service last night is now going through, round and round in my head. And I said, yeah, the same thing's happening to me. And, uh, you know, you don't realise what is happening. Because what, what a revival is, is actually God coming down in a location in a much stronger way than what you, your average church service. You know, we all... The, the presence of God is there in the church service, but in a revival, it's, it's like someone's turned the volume right up and the, and the power of God is so real where people will shake, fall down, uh, they'll call out, they'll cry, they'll weep. Um, and as the pastor said in that church, he said it's not about the shaking or the falling down, it's about what's happened to that person while they were, fall, while they were under the power of God lying on the floor and how that life has been transformed 
when they get back up. And usually they have a greater, a greater uh, sense of the lost, the people in the world. They, they, they're more inclined to see those people as people that really need salvation. Uh, they have a, no, a greater love of God and a greater sense of uh, um, satis satisfaction. Um, so we went there for four days and then we came, came back to Australia and we got together with our pastor and his wife and they were talking about various uh, financial things to do with the church and, and Judy turned to them and said, oh, what do you, when you've got Jesus, why do, you, why do you need to worry about those things? It was like those things, those worldly things no longer seem significant. It was, it was truly amazing. And that was the, when we went there, it was November 1998. We came back, it was, when we got back, it was the beginning of the school holidays. We had people over from the church showing them videos that we'd, we'd bought while we were there. Every night, I think of the week, didn't we, for about five or six weeks? And we were supernaturally energized to the point where we did not feel it was an effort at all. We had people over every, every night for like six weeks. And God had, I don't know, given us this supernatural energy and this unbelievable, contagious sort of enthusiasm about what, what he was doing there. Uh, Three million people went through that church in five years. It went from 1995 to the year 2000. And three million people went, came from all over the world, all, all nations, all races, uh, all different denominations. They were from, you know, Catholic, Anglican, whatever they were, you know, Methodist. People wanted more of God, and they got it when they came to Brownsville. There was a queue that had formed one day and the pastor went out and started speaking to people to find out, you know, how it was that they found out about it and why were they there. And he said to one, one man, he said, uh, oh, where are you from? And I think he said Wisconsin, which is right up the north in America, almost up to where Canada is. And he said, oh, how'd you hear about it? I didn't. He said, why are you here? I don't know. <laughs> he said, had you heard something like, you know, go to Brownsville? <laughs> you know, God's, God's there. He didn't even, you know, couldn't even explain why he was there. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I could go on all day about the phenomenal things that happened in that revival. But that's, that's not the only revival that's ever happened. There's other ones. Um, if, go, if I go to people like John Wesley, um, John Wesley obviously had an anointing on his life and he would preach all across England on horseback. It's estimated that he travelled 240,000 miles on horseback and it, as he got older by coach, horses and, and a coach, to get to the different speaking engagements that he had all across England. And one day he rode all the way from uh, Bristol to London in, in just one horse ride. I think he had to change horses along the way, but it was, it was just so empowered by God. And, and he would speak to like 5,000 people out in the open. And, but, you know, with revival comes a lot of opposition. He might be preaching to 5,000 people who wanted to hear, but he also had people on the outside throwing sticks and stones and all sorts of things at him. You know, he was not... If revival comes, you're going to get opposition. Pastor John Kilpatrick, who was the pastor at Brownsville Revival, straight after revival hit, which was on Father's Day 1995, the 6th of June 1995, he had people that were long-term long members of the church come to him and say, Pastor, we want to have a talk with you because we don't like what's going on. You know, things were not the same as they were. It was If you look at it on the day that the Holy Spirit fell on Brownsville. Very conservative-looking 
white shirts, dark ties for the men. Uh, the women were all dressed very conservatively. But after that, people started coming in from everywhere. You had drug addicts and prostitutes and you know, all sorts of broken people coming to the church because the power of God was drawing people from everywhere. And it was a completely different church to what these people had known. They, they, they were a very conservative church. And the pastor himself was a person who, as described by members of the congregation, they said he was a pastor who wanted everything under control, you know, do this at this time, and then we do that. And the day that Steve Hill, the evangelist, came to Brownsville, which was the cat catalyst for the revival happening, um, John Kilpatrick had just lost his mother. His mother was a very godly woman. And his father had left him when he was very young and he'd been taken under the wing of, of, of another um, Lutheran pastor who used to teach him how to pray and they'd go to prayer meetings at night and all this sort of stuff. Anyway, the day before Father's Day, John Kilpatrick was at a very low point. And he got together that night on the Saturday night at, a, sounds funny, at the Red Lobster, some, some seafood place that they went to for dinner with his wife and with the evangelist, Steve Hill. And his wife, who'd already, who'd just been to Toronto because Toronto, the Toronto revival happened just before Brownsville broke out. She'd gone up there with some members of the church and been touched at Toronto. And Steve Hill had heard about a revival that was taking place in London at Holy Trinity Brompton, which is an Anglican church. And God was moving there as a result of a woman going to Toronto and then coming back and then having a meeting with, with people at uh, Holy Trinity Brompton. And revival broke out there. Now, I'm probably going a bit all over the place here, but Holy Trinity Brompton is where Alpha came from. The Alpha Course, you've seen the Alpha Course? advertised or anyone no one no well it's it's a it's a christian course that came up out of holy trinity brompton after revival hit that church and it's it's had a huge impact it's gone through all the denominational churches you see the signs out you know to do the alpha course which is all it's like christianity explained and um so Steve Hill had been in Russia planting churches. He was the evangelist that finished up in Brownsville for the next, I think it was about five or eight years, got a long time anyway. But he'd heard about the revival that had hit the Holy Trinity Brompton while he was planting churches in Russia after reading a, Times magaz a Time magazine talking about this thing. And he made an appointment with the minister at Holy Trinity Brompton to come and see him. When he got there on this Saturday afternoon, he entered the church. There were people all over the floor. There were people praying for people. And he said, look, I've, it came up to one of the people praying, and he said, I've got an appointment with Sandy Miller, the, the pastor there. But he said, just pray for me. So this, this person just touched him on the forehead. He said he fell to the floor. He said he'd, you know, he'd, come, he'd gone under the power of God before, but nothing like this. He said he got up, and he, said, he went to another person who was praying. He said, I'll pray for me again. With that touch from God at this revival. He then went back to America. And so now we've got Steve Hill, John Kilpatrick, his wife Brenda, having dinner at the, at the Red Lobster the night before revival broke out. Steve Hill and Brenda had both been touched by God and were all excited, all excitedly talking backwards and forwards. And John Kilpatrick was sitting there thinking, you know, I don't feel like I'm a part of this at all. He was, he was very depressed because his mother had died only, I think, only a week or two before. And he was so low that he, he said to Steve Hill, you preach tomorrow because I just don't feel like I'm up to it. He said, normally on a Father's Day Sunday, it will be the, the head pastor who does the preaching. So Steve Hill got up and started talking about his experience about being in Russia, then going to Holy Trinity Brompton in London and being touched and then coming back. And he explained that when he was still in England, he rang his wife, who was fairly, fairly pregnant at the time. 
He said, this is how Americans talk, baby, baby, God's touched me. And his wife's saying, oh, yeah, Steve, yeah, yeah, he's always touching you. Oh, no, 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 this is different, this is different. And he said he prayed for his wife over the phone, and she's in America, he's in England, and she falls out under the power of God just simply by, by that, that conversation. Anyway, Sunday morning, Father's Day, 1995, he's at Brownsville Assembly of God, preaching this message, telling everyone how uh, he'd been touched. And he said, in a minute, I'm going to give the opportunity to get, to, to get a touch from God. I'm going to pray for the fire to, fire to fall on you. And the pastor, John Kilpatrick, who's the head pastor at Brownsville, sitting off to one side on a chair on the platform, and he's thinking, oh, no, Steve. I'm going to be here all day. If you're going to pray for everyone, we'll be here forever. And it's Father's Day and everybody wants to go back home and have Father's Day lunch with their family. So Steve Hill gets to the end of his preach and he says, okay, anyone that wants prayer, come out the front. Everyone was kind of hungry for it. Steve Hill had been talking so excitedly about this and there were people in the church that really wanted more of God. And... So they, he started to pray, fire, Lord, fire, fire, like this, just on the, you know, touching their head, and their people were falling out. And, and uh, John Kilpatrick, who was still sitting on the platform, eventually got up off the chair and with reluctance came over thinking, oh, I better, I better help him. <laughs> so he comes over, but after a couple of minutes, I've got this on video and it's really worth seeing. He's got the microphone. He's, now, John Kilpatrick's got the microphone as well as Steve Hill's got a microphone. He said, folks, because he felt something happen. He said he felt like a river went through his legs, through his legs. He said, this is real, folks. I'm telling you, you don't miss out. Come, come and get prayed for. About a half a minute after that, he fell back on the platform, on his back, and he was, he was out for four hours his son later said that had to be real because my father would never, ever do, be, allow himself to get out of control like that. With that, the revival in Brownsville started. Steve Hill, who was only supposed to be there for that day, finished up staying for eight years as the evangelist. He said sometimes we'd get so tired at night, uh, day, night after night after night after night <laughs> He said, uh, Pastor John Kilpatrick and myself would come to the end of the evening and just virtually collapse in, in, in each other's arms. He was, well, they were that tired from it. It makes a huge difference to the church. The people in the church change, but then that change also draws in, and God's power draws in people as it did there from all over the world, uh, having a tremendous effect, you know, like, like Judy, I know Judy and I are both still still touch. I mean, nothing has affected us like having come to that revival. So if, if, you, if, you're praying for, if you're praying for God to move, just keep praying because your life will change. The life of the people within the church will change. And it, it brings the opportunity for people. We, we, we see so many people in Australia now, they're not Christians and they don't know God and I, I mean I look around and I can't believe the sort of things that I see going on in the world today compared with how, how I grew up. You know, I'm 69, life was not like we see it today. You just wouldn't have accepted it. So just a few notes on some of the, the, some of the people that have really been at the forefront of revivals down through the ages. John Wesley, who was around during the 1700s, I gave you a brief rundown on what he, what he was doing, crisscrossing England, speaking at up to three different places in a day, riding tremendous number of miles, and then never, ever missed an opportunity. If you read that there's... Uh, He's got journals. He used to write down things every day about the, what, where he'd been and what had happened. Uh, his horse threw a shoe, so he had to go to a blacksmith in order to get a new shoe put on the horse. 
It's a bit like getting a new tyre on your car. But he didn't miss that opportunity. He witnessed to the person who was the blacksmith putting the new shoe on his horse and got him saved. One day, he's riding along, he's, he's thinking, I haven't had any persecution for the last three or four days. He got off the horse, knelt down to pray, to say, God, you know, what am I doing wrong? And someone on the other side of the hedge to where he was heard the voice. He said, that's that John Wesley, and he threw a stone at him. <laughs> they, said, they said to uh, John Wesley, why do so many people come and watch you preach? He said, I set myself on fire, and people come and watch me burn. The opposition came to John Wesley in the form that he went back to the town that he grew up in, a town called Epworth. They wouldn't let him preach there because at this point he's, he's made a name for himself. He's too radical for the, the traditional sort of churches. So he, had to, he went back to the church that evening and told people he was going to be preaching, but he had to stand on his father's grave to preach. And, and hundreds of people came out to listen to him preaching from his father's gravestone in the churchyard at Epworth. Then following, in the next hundred years, so that was in the 1700s, God then rose up William and Catherine Booth, who we know as the Salvation Army. They were the, they were the following on, they, were the, you know, they followed on from, from John Wesley. John Wesley established the Methodist Church. Methodist Church started off obviously with, you know, great gusto, but by the time William Booth, a hundred years later, who's now in that Methodist church, realises that it's, it's not the same church. It's, it's, it's a watered down version of what Wesley would have started. So they start their own church called the Salvation Army and their, their motto, they've got badges and it says blood and fire, the blood of Jesus and the fire of the Holy Spirit did tremendous work, brought prostitutes out of prostitution, got people out of pubs. Uh, they would take the, the songs of the day, but, or the music of the day that people were singing in pubs and places, but they put the words, they put, put the sound to Christian songs um, so that people were familiar, who were familiar with the songs would then be ready to sing those songs to the, with the Christian words because they already knew the melody. Okay, following that, you go forward another 50 or 60 years and you've got the Welsh Revival which started in 1904 and up to 1906. And as an aside to that, uh, there was a, a Baptist minister preaching at Kenmore, Kenmore Baptist Church back in 1990 seven or eight I think it was and he was t he was preaching at night time and he was preaching about the Holy Spirit and he said uh, at the end anyone who wants to receive the Holy Spirit I'm going to pray for those people well Judy's brother younger brother was at that service he said that uh, Norman Moss came came down and didn't even touch Judy's brother, and Judy's brother f fell out under the, Holy under the power of the Holy Spirit that night. He said when he got up, he, th he thought he'd been out for about 10 minutes. He looked at his watch and he'd been about for about an hour. He said he could hardly make his way out to the car. What, what uh, Norman Moss, that Baptist minister from England, said that night at Kenmore Baptist Church was that he'd come in contact with some, some women who were just young girls at the time when the Welsh revival happened. They'd been praying for a revival in their church and they heard that there was a revi revival had hit the church down the road. I think they were about 16 at the time. They went down to that church and they saw people standing on pews and ca calling out, you know, the sort of excitement that uh, Pastor Amos was uh, demonstrating this morning. They turned to each other and said, this isn't revival. We better go back to our church and keep praying for revival. Years passed and they realised they'd missed one of the greatest moves of God in Wales that had ever happened. And their words to Norman Wass were, 
if revival comes, don't miss it. Because they had. They'd missed it in their own country of Wales. The next one was Azusa Street. Azusa Street, you'd like this. The pastor was black. He had one eye. His church was an old, uh, had, was a warehouse at one point, but it had been turned into a, a blacksmith downstairs and a, and a storage upstairs for hay for horses and stuff. So it was, it was rather a dilapidated building, but that's all they could afford. They took over that building and the Azusa Street revival started there in Azusa Street in Los Angeles in 1906. As a result of them making contact with people in the, in the Welsh revival that, that were, that they, start, they heard about the Welsh revival in Los Angeles and started communicating with them and, and through letters and things, it, it uh, started to, it broke out there in Los Angeles. So if, if, you, if you think about the things that I've mentioned today, Toronto birthed Brownsville, Welsh Revival birthed Azusa Street, and when people go there, they can take it, they can take it back to their church. It depends on how the church receives them and the demonstrations of power of the Holy Spirit. If, if they reject it, it, it won't go anywhere. If, they, if the pastor of the church accepts it, then possibly it will, you know, affect that church as well. The next revival was in the Hebridean revival, which was on the Isle of Lewis. It's one of the faraway islands um, on the northwest of Scotland. Uh, this has a, a, an interesting twist to it. There were two elderly sisters who were in their 80s who could see that the, the, um, the, clim the Christian climate in the island, there were, I think there were 20,000 people that lived on the island and there were fewer and fewer people going to church. Most people brought their children up to fear God but they could see that the attendance at church was going down and so they started to pray that, you know, for, for God to come and visit that island. The cousin of the two sisters who prayed and then revival did come through a minister called Duncan Campbell. Uh, she was the cousin, um, Mary MacDonald MacLeod, who left the Isle of Lewis to go to America and married a man called Fred Trump. Yes. <laughs> Fred Trump and Mary gave birth to a, a, a child called Donald Trump and when Donald Trump became president, they sent a Bible, an old worn Bible from the Isle of Lewis. Oh, sorry, I think they sent it to the mother world when Donald Trump was young, that's right. And he used that Bible, he put that old worn out Bible on top of the, uh, another Bible on the day that he accepted the, you know, on the day of inauguration of the presidency back in 2000 and 17, I think it was, and he's the only person in America now who's is a politician who's standing up for godly things. There is a re reference. This is in 1 Kings 8, chapter 11, uh, verse 11. It says, The priests could not stand, for a cl cloud had come into the house of God, cloud of the glory of God, and they couldn't stand as a result of that. Now, the glory talk about glory and we say glory but glory means the heavy presence of God so the priests couldn't stand because of the heavy presence of God um, and that is an illustration of or rather that gives the precedence for the sort of things that you see happening in in, um, in revivals people do fall down under the power of God but they get up transformed. Oh, that's right. Wesley. Wesley traveled, as I said, was in England during the, the 17th, the 1700s, but about the 1750s through to about 1790. There was another evangelist at the time called George Whitfield. Now, George Whitfield 
didn't believe um, what was happening with, in some of Wesley's meetings because Wesley had already experienced people falling down and, and shaking and all this sort of thing. But they were together this night and the next morning George Whitfield held the evangelistic meeting and he said he, could, he then had the opportunity of seeing it for himself because as he was preaching, four men fell down almost instantaneously. One just lay there silent, another one was groaning, another one was crying, and I forget what the fourth one was doing, but they, they'd all, and, and George Whitfield got to see that, uh, that, that it was real, that what Wesley had experienced in his meetings was also real. Judy wants to uh, just give a quick talk about how it affected her um, when we went to Brownsville. This, this is a whole... This, this is a whole book about the, um, the Azusa Street Revival. They put out their own newsletter, and these are all stories of people affected by the revival and, and what, ha what actually happened to them. Healings and people speaking in tongues for the first time and you know, people falling in love with Jesus. <laughs> But I just want to tell you just some of the few things where it affected me personally. Um, I was, at the time when I went to the Brownsville Revival, we went there three times, actually went back to the United States. And um, it's hard for me to talk about this, the Holy Spirit, I could feel it all over me. But um, I, was the, I was a fashion writer, and um, at one of the preachers that we were there, one of the nights, the minister said... Um, he got up and said, so many young men are addicted to pornography because of um, just straight out um, shopping catalogues that show you know, women in lingerie and, and swimwear. And of course, um, having worked as a journalist for many years, I actually had to do um, fashion shoots with lingerie, swimwear, and basically, the more, the sexier, the better, as far as the editors were concerned. Um, so I got tremendously convicted. Um, where I had to um, run forward for repentance. And um, anyway, I, I ran forward and I said to God, I will, I'll never do another fashion shoot like this again. Um, when I get back to Australia, I just will not do another fashion shoot that has that type of way about it where, where people are, you know, where the girls are posing in kind of like sexy ways and they've got swimwear on and skimpy lingerie and all this sort of thing. And I, when I came back to Australia, I never did. I never did another fashion shoot like that again. I found the conviction of the Holy Spirit is so powerful in, under revival, where suddenly your sin becomes so incredibly exposed, you know. There was, when you'd be at the nights of this revival, there were just literally hundreds of people would run to the altar um, to confess their sin and give their lives to Christ. And, you know, we don't realise it, sort of, it's when the, the Holy Spirit is so powerful, we actually see just the, the actual sin in us and what we're doing. Um, you know, one night the, the minister said, also the evangelist said, he said, young people, and I think of all you young people that are sitting in here today, and he said, young people, have you gone through things? And then, and, they, and he said, if you haven't, you will. You will go through things. Thank you. And, um, and, and I just wanted to say to you, I was sort of thinking, you know, I see all your young people each week, they, you come to church with your families and all that, and you're very faithful with getting up and, you know, in the praise and worship team and all that. And there'll come a day when you'll have to make your own choice. Am I going to go to church now? You know, you're no longer having to go with mum and dad, but you're going to have to make your own choices. You, and you have to stand alone, because in Australia there's so much secular... You know, you go to, you'll, you'll go to university, you'll go into workplaces where people don't believe in God. And if you stand for Jesus, you'll have to be strong and stand alone. 
when I was a journalist, most of the people spent their lunch hours in the pub and drinking all the time and they swore a lot and things like that. And I, I worked under a women's editor who said to me, if you don't go to the pub and start drinking, because I didn't drink, you won't be able to get any stories, right? But, and I thought, that's ridiculous. How can there possibly be stories at the pub? All it is is all the journalists there drinking. There's no stories there. So, you know, you have to stand, you have to stand strong and, and, and know that Jesus is with you because this, when you have been in revival, you realise it is so exciting, you know, to be with the Lord. It's just nothing, nothing short of exciting, really exciting because he's got great plans for you and your life is just, it just takes on a whole new dimension. When we came back from Brownsville, we've never stopped wanting to tell people about Jesus and it's been, what, how many years now? Like, like 25 years ago or something. But we were so touched by the Holy Spirit that I still burn for the lost. I'm 69, I burn for the lost still, you know. I, I, I love to see the young people come in, particularly the young people in Australia who were lost. They need God, you know, and they need, they need God. And they need young people like you just to be light to them, young people, you know, for the next generation. Barry talked about um, the Alpha Course and the Holy Trinity Brompton in London. We went there. Now, the Holy Trinity Brompton revival in London, right in the heart of London, near Harrods, in the up-class area of London, came as a result of one lady going to the Toronto revival and coming back and praying over the ministers at this conservative Anglican church in the middle of London. So Barry and I decided we'll go and visit this church in London because out of it had come the Alpha Course, which went worldwide in every nation with every language you could imagine. It's turned, like millions of people have been saved through the Alpha Course. So what happened, we turned up to the church, it's like five o'clock in the afternoon, and like England, it's winter, it's cold, it's, you think nobody's going to be there, it's an Anglican church, isn't it? And, you know, and we get there and the place within minutes is packed and it's got balcony levels and everything and there, it's all packed and it's all young people, all on fire for God. And out of that church, they've actually planted other churches, they've actually gone into all these old churches in other parts of London and set them on fire. So, you know, you see what can happen out of one church. You know, it, it all starts with prayer. When John Kilpatrick um, started praying for revival, and I can't remember how many years he prayed now, it's gone out of my head, you might remember. But anyway, they, they started by putting up prayer banners all around the church. Those are like flag type things and it had like revival and you know, healing the nations and all different things, repentance and all this. And anyway, he said he'd come in at the middle of the night in the, in the church and start praying for revival, even on his own. And he'd say to God, God, I want more of you. I don't want a television program. I don't want more people. I don't want a big fancy church. All I want is you, Lord. All I want is you. Send your revival. Because we can't make it as a church on the earth much longer. And that's what he would say. And then, you know, what came out of that Brown Street revival has been amazing. And, and honestly, he, he runs a massive church in America now. And he goes all over America to minister to the broken ministers in America broken ministers who are wanting to give up ministry because they couldn't take it anymore. So, you know, um, we're a small church, but I believe the heart here is right. I know, I know Pastor Ramos, Brother Muzo, Pastor Sam are so committed to prayer and fasting that I think great things can come out of this church. I believe that in Jesus' name. Amen to that. <laughs>